uh, continue this morning with the discussion that we've been having around um, not only ESCOM but SOEs in general. The state of the country's state-owned entities, including ESCOM, SAA, Danel, continuing to deteriorate. Uh, corruption and mismanagement being cited as the leading causes of the fall of these entities. Let's bring in independent analyst Rutendo Martin Yarare, who believes that South Africa can learn lessons from neighboring Zimbabwe insofar as uh, SOEs here in the country are concerned. Rutendo, let me thank you for your time uh, this morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming into studio. Um, and you've penned quite an interesting article that talks about the lessons that South Africa can learn insofar as SOEs are concerned and Zimbabwe's Zisco Steel. Tell us some of the sort of key findings you've come up with. Right. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, for me, what I've realized is that many people in Africa don't yet understand how the world works. It's a race for resources and capitalism is about captivating and capturing resources in order to build monopolies. And so what we saw with Cisco Steel was sabotage of mm. Cisco Steel by monopoly makers. And these monopoly makers were companies like uh, um, um, Anglo America, um, ESCO of South Africa, um, Lancaster Steel, and Voost Alpine that was manufacturing the machines that were used in smelting iron and steel in Zimbabwe. Now, Cisco Steel is in many ways very similar to ESCOM. Cisco Steel was the biggest steel and iron manufacturer in the Southern Hemisphere, the biggest in Africa, the biggest in Brazil, Australia. And what the problem was, was when we got independence, the Western world was not happy to bestow an African country with the ability to produce iron and the ability to sophisticate iron and to create military hardware and industrial hardware that would have industrialized uh, Zimbabwe or Africa. The reason being, once the Second World War ended, there was a plan called the uh, Morgenthau Plan. The Morgenthau Plan was supposed to deindustrialize Japan and Germany so that they would never rise to become superpowers that would challenge the Western world or the Western banking system. So what they did is they wanted to turn them into agrarian societies, take out their industry, block their mines, take their workers that were most technical and take them out of Germany and out of Japan so that these countries could never rise to industrialize. Eventually what happened is Germany's lack of development, Japan's lack of development made it difficult for the West to compete with Russia. It made it difficult for the West to compete with Russia, which was now bringing communism. So they were forced to allow Germany and Japan to develop so that Western capitalism could show as an example in these regions as a success. But for this Western capitalism to take place, for the Marshall Plan to be given to these Western countries to rise themselves up, they needed cheap resources. Mm. So what did they have to do? They had to keep, they had to now take the Morgenthau Plan, this underdevelopment plan, this agrarian society plan to Africa. And so that meant that they had to deindustrialize African countries that had just come out of colonialism to ensure that they'll never be able to sophisticate their resources so that those resources will be passed so, on. So, so keep African countries Absolutely. sort of under your thumb? Correct. So that you can use them to your benefit. And this is exactly what's happening here in South Africa with ESCOM. Because you have to understand that ESCOM itself was created by a private monopoly that was led by um, um, the, um, what you call it, the um, 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 Cecil John Rhodes' company, the British South Africa uh, company. And it created ESCOM as private entities initially, where they were providing uh, electricity to a lot of the mining industries. And with the biggest mining industry in the world in South Africa, you quickly develop the biggest electricity uh, supplier in the world. So what they realize is that if you want to be the biggest electricity supplier, you have to consolidate all these small electricity suppliers and make one electricity supplier, which became the Victoria Falls Power a supply company that was owned by Cecil John Rhodes. And if you remember, all British South Africa companies were then taken by Anglo America. Mm. Anglo America is the same one that we see having a problem in Cisco Steel. So Anglo America becomes this agent of un sabotaging Africa to ensure that it doesn't industrialize and to keep the industrialization capacity mm. in areas controlled by whites, which is why it lasted in apartheid South Africa. So how does this play into the, the, the current state of ESCOM? Though? Right. Because, because when we talk about the current state of ESCOM, we're talking about the state capture years of the past 12 years, right? How does this history help us understand what happened during the state capture years? That's a false narrative. The state captures happened with Anglo-America and white capital. 
and then this false narrative that a company like the Guptas that control less than 5% of the economy have captured the state How is false. How is it a false narrative though? We've just had an entire uh, commission of inquiry detailing how um, lieutenants of the Guptas and particular government uh, leaders were put in ESCOM and other SOEs with the chief um, aim of, of, of looting it, of, of hollowing it out through corruption. The state inquiry is a farce. It's an embarrassment, quite frankly. The state capture inquiry? Yes, because it's false. That's why you see that even Glencore doesn't appear. Wait, wait, the, you're saying the, the state capture inquiry is false? It's the a The evidence that we heard for two years is false and it a farce? Was, it was tailored evidence to manufacture consent to a certain narrative. But it's not true. What and isn't true? It's not true that the people that were, were, were questioned on the State Capture Commission are the capturers of the state. You have a situation where Anglo-America controlled 60% of this economy, followed by um, the Ruperts who controlled another 20% and so forth and so on. How is it that people that have less than 5% of the economy captured the economy? How but, does that but, but the estimates are this morning, uh, Rutendo, that hundreds of billions left our country through state capture. And, and there's forensic evidence detailing exactly that. Where is the where's the forensic evidence being tested for you to prove that as a reality? It is a narrative. Well, and we're living with the reality, aren't we? So let's give you a reality again. Remember we heard that there were weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq. They were never found. And there was supposed to be evidence because it was never tested and there's this Western agenda to always make a story a reality that never gets tested. That's what we're seeing with the State Capture Commission. And I'm not saying this so that we just cause problems. I'm saying this so that you get to the root cause of the problem that you have in South Africa. And I'm saying Zisco Steel, Anglo-America was central to the destruction of Zisco Steel to maintain white monopoly and white capture. And let me tell you another thing. Whenever a society has had a crime against humanity happen against it, we usually have, for instance, with Nazi Germany, people being brought to book, people being taken to court and taken out of society. In South Africa, you've got a problem in the aspect that in South Africa, we had the very same people that perpetuated the crime against humanity still running society, running the media, running the companies, running banking, and continuously perpetuating the crimes of apartheid in a modern-day democracy by lies and doing the same things that were done during apartheid. We will never know the truth as long as the criminals of the apartheid system are running the economy for the same ends and the same purposes of apartheid, which was exploitation of the mineral resources of this country. And remember, ESCOM was built off the gold, platinum, and, and exploitation of the diamonds of South Africa. And when the m m mining companies were paying for those services. They were not paying enough in order to allow for replacement cost in future. They were simply making money for the moment. What we've got now is that we've got an ESCOM that did not save enough from the services that it gave these mining companies. Those profits went into the mining companies that are outside the country. Some of them are leaving because the gold is finished. Some of them are leaving because uh, iron is finished. And they've taken the profits that should have been channeled into ESCOM, that should have been part and parcel of the replacement cost and the depreciation of what ESCOM would need to rebuild itself today. And the bankers have also sabotaged you in the aspect that the moment we get to 2017, you see a company called Future Growth that belongs to uh, Old Mutual saying that we'll no longer give loans to SOEs, particularly ESCOM. And so that started a regime of sanctions of trying to bleed the government and not give it money to build its infrastructure. They also said they would influence other finances across the world not to give South African SOEs and the South African government money. That is a regime change agenda. And I, I, that is an agenda to, to, to de-industrialize to... South Africa, as I've been saying I, with the Morgan Plan. I have Morgan to interrupt you there, Rotendo. Um, I'm trying to understand how you can erase 12 years of state capture by just dismissing it as, as a farce. Who exactly would be orchestrating this farce? And are you going to reply and say the West? Well, it's interesting. How can we not re erase 12 years if we've erased 135 years of state capture by Anglo-America and the uh, companies that were formed out of the Sisso Don't forget that companies. 20 years ago, Eskom was an incredibly successful company. No, it wasn't. It was. We then had electricity. We, our maintenance program was on track. We had um, uh, profitability. We were exporting our excess power outside of the country as well. You were doing that while 70% of South Africa didn't have electricity. Many people were living in darkness in a country that was producing what no, you call... I said 20 years ago, not yes, 27. I'm, I'm talking about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you did not have electricity for everybody. 
you actually had 70% of your people without electricity. Yeah. They were excluded. And the labor of these people, the, the pittance that they were being paid in mines and the jobs that they were working where they were paid 10% of what a white person doing the same job would earn, was money that was being used to subsidize ESCOM for it to be a social welfare system for the mining so companies. So the success and of ESCOM two decades ago was a false narrative? It was a false narrative. And it was a false narrative that if we allow ourselves to make that narrative, then we become complicit with an apartheid system that excluded 70% of the people because they were black and we don't care about them, yet we only gave services to 30% who were basically being subsidized by those that didn't have electricity. Okay, let's talk, those about, that were being, let's uh, talk about Madupi and Kusile power stations that are wholly over budget um, to the tune of billions. I'm, I'm on my phone now trying to find the exact number. Wholly over budget insofar as what was budgeted initially, um, in terms of maintenance costs, it's, it's hundreds of billions of rands in excess. Okay, who do we blame that on? Right, that's a good question. And I always like to use history as, as my guide. So what is happening at Madupi and Kusile has happened before when they were creating ESCOM. We had a company that was called uh, Dick and Kerr. Dick and Kerr company was supposed to provide electricity for Johannesburg uh, municipality for its tram system and the electricity in Johannesburg plus Rand mines. So what they did is they went to buy machinery from England in order to power the generation of power that was going to be generated by we engines. Talking we're talking 1905. And so they got engines from the English who were not good at making electricity machinery. The electricity machinery was mainly made by Germans, particularly a, um, a AE, AEG, uh, Siemens, and other companies like that. They made the best machines, but the economy was controlled by the British, and they wanted their British companies to get the contracts to provide the machinery. So what happened with this company, this Dick and Kerr, is that all their machinery started collapsing. People were dying on the job, people were being asphyxiated in the, in the plant because it was burning uh, gas, but that gas was becoming toxic. Eventually, this entire plant collapsed. But even the collapse of this plant was very weird. We had trams that sank at, she at, at sea. We had one of the uh, chief engineers dying on the job. The very same things you're seeing happening with ESCOM, which looked like sabotage, that was done by the Victoria Falls uh, power company that was owned by Rhodes so that they would get a monopoly. So eventually the entire plant of uh, Dick and Kerr collapsed. And that, many people say, was because of the English machinery that was obsolete. Some people say it was because of sabotage by these this, guys who wanted to build the monopoly. To Today, Kusile? this is what's happening at Kusile. You, Kusile, we've got Hitachi that's come in. They're not the best at producing electricity power. They're not the best at generating electricity power. So there is a chance that we've chosen the wrong service provider. But there is also a chance that what happened in the past, the sabotage that could be happening at these plants by other interests that are trying to perpetuate a monopoly that existed, and we've learned this in history before. And so if you look at what's happened at Kusile, we actually need a commission of inquiry, which is what they did in, in, in 1910. They had a commission of inquiry to find out what was happening which in the electricity. Of inquiry. This commission of inquiry was a farce. It was, not, it was not honest, it did not have the right questions, and it did not look at the right scope. You cannot have a commission inquiry of state capture. You do not have a Glencoe in there, you do not have Anglo-America in there, you do not have uh, 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 what you call it, uh, uh, the Ruperts in there. You do not have the owners of capital, people like Old Mutual, who had been sabotaging this region, even during apartheid, to ensure that apartheid never ended. We cannot have a commission of inquiry that doesn't look at those criminals. All right, Rotendo Martin Yarare, thanks very much indeed for coming in on that. Thank you so um, much. Important on that interesting note, I should say, and uh, Medupia and Kusile, eight years late, 300 billion rand over budget. Um, that was the number that I was looking for just a little earlier.